So I've been a tad quiet for a little while, and you may have pondered why that was. Well, I left my old job, spent a whole month questioning my entire life, got a new job, fought off an army of lobster people with nothing but an expired breadstick, but most importantly, I started reading One Piece! Yes, I took the plunge. I dived headfirst into the reigning king of shonen, finally basking in the story of Captain Bungie Gum and his Nakama. This was a long time coming. I had a lot of reasons to finally start it, the main one just being sheer curiosity. I never watched it when I was young. I was more of a Naruto kid, but I did usually catch the first few minutes exclusively for its opening, which when I was six was the best thing I had ever heard, and that remains so. But it's also a part of my mission to find something to match my hero academia in, to put it bluntly, how much I give a sh**. I went back to Naruto, which wasn't as good as I remembered. I tried Black Clover, which I was told got good after 30 episodes. It didn't. And I tried Hunter x Hunter, which was... <laughs> <laughs> you know what, we'll get there someday. But if anything so far has come the closest to reaching My Hero Academia's ceiling for me, it's One Piece. Which isn't really surprising seeing how it clearly was an influence on it. Plus, Horikoshi's evidently a fan. So why am I talking about it today? Well, I recently hit a milestone of 500 chapters. I know that's not exactly halfway, as it's 1,035 chapters long at time of recording, but I didn't get to where I am today by being precise. And I just thought, hey, let's talk about it. Now, let me start by saying I am painfully aware I am late to the game here. At this point, it's near impossible to bring up something that hasn't already been said, but that's not really my goal here. I started a thing that I like, and I'd like to share why I like it in this little thought piece. A one piece thought piece, a one thought piece piece. <coughs> Ladies, gents, and weebs of every gender, welcome to Curmudgeon Media. I'm Ed, and I'm going to talk about my experience reading the first 500 chapters of One Piece. Funnily enough, if I had to compare the feeling of reading One Piece to anything, it's when I read Berserk, which was actually fairly recently, in that there's a rather surreal feeling you get when you blast through what is decades of an artist's work, thinking about how long fans must have waited to get to this point, only for you to turn up and get there in a fragment of the time. And when you pause and look back, it really takes a second to grasp just how much you've covered. By chapter 500, One Piece has covered East Blue, Alabaster, Sky Island, Water 7, Thriller Bark, and the beginnings of the Summit War, each of those having at least three smaller arcs within them, with many characters, factions, and environments building a deep and layered world, which from an outsider perspective may make it seem like a mountain in and of itself. But here's the thing, it kind of isn't. Aside from a general awareness of its length, it never felt convoluted or too big to roll into. And I can think of a couple of reasons for this, and I suppose the most obvious one is everybody's favourite novelty toy, Monkey D. Luffy. I imagine at the time of his conception, Luffy may not seem that innovative to shonen protagonists, with the likes of Goku being clear points of comparison. But as someone who's basically going backwards through shonen, it's actually quite interesting to compare him to the protagonists of today, who often have a bit more nuance to them. And rather than adding more nuances, or making him more well-rounded, they double down on his strengths. You do get glimpses into his backstory, but it's nowhere near as tragic as some of his contemporaries. He doesn't have any internal anxieties, he has no love interest, nor really much that can be considered relatable. He is just two things, pure of heart, dumb of ass. Oh yeah, and also hungry. Which is actually a shonen protagonist I'm less acquainted with. If you're more affiliated with modern anime, it makes him surprisingly refreshing for a 20-year-old series. And seeing him approach things in a way only he would is hilarious and endearing, typically not registering the severity of the situations he's in. And if he does, he doesn't care. In a world filled to the brim with rules, systems, and bureaucracies, Luffy is a big rock with a silly face drawn on it, smashing through all of it. And I think it's cranking that aspect to 11 that stops him from being annoying. As I I'm heavily aware I'm not meant to relate to him or read too much into him, but rather I'm to see how far his one-track mind takes him, and more importantly, where it takes everyone around him. The rest of the Straw Hats are the ones who carry the more layered characteristics, the ones who seem more human than Luffy. And I say that with full awareness that they consist of a deer baby, a cyborg in a Hawaiian shirt, and a skeleton with an afro, each with their own tragedies and burdens to bear. And some of those are just… <sighs> holy hell. It's always fascinating to me when something incredibly cartoonish makes me feel much more than most serious dramas. The same series where a cyborg escapes capture by farting can have me in tears ten chapters later. Also, I cried over a boat. 
and you did too, don't lie. But I feel that cartoonishness is another point that stops the massive scope from being overbearing. Despite its enormous cast of characters, it never felt confusing to understand who is with what group or faction, mainly because the art style makes every character appear extravagant or memorable for one reason or another. If I see a very large man with a bible and a panda hat, or someone who's maneuvered his hair into a giant three, I'm going to remember them. And I do remember them when they inevitably get reincorporated. I've got far enough into the series that new characters or plot developments link to something seemingly minor that was hundreds of chapters ago. And in spite of that, it feels seamless when things come back into play, even if it was entirely gone from your mind until then. Again, I can't say anything that hasn't already been said, so I guess the best way to do it is with a simple example. As the Straw Hats journey across the Grand Line, their first encounter is with a giant whale called Laboon, who was part of a pirate crew that supposedly abandoned him 50 years ago. Yet Laboon remains where he was left, still maintaining faith that his crew didn't just leave him and that they will return. Luffy and the crew cheer him up and then they're off on their next adventure. At the time, you just think, that was nice. That was a fun way to establish the surreal nature of the Grand Line, and then you don't really think about it again. Then 300 chapters later, we're introduced to Brooke, a skeleton musician who is the sole survivor of the crew that seemingly abandoned Laboon. And Brooke has tormented himself with the guilt that he could never return to his friend. But after joining the Straw Hats, Brooke vows to one day keep his promise and reunite with Laboon. Having that work back into the story felt like your brain doing a double take. The whole encounter with Laboon didn't feel big at the time, but now it's part of a key character's story and motivation. It's not just a Chekhov's gun, it's a Chekhov's over sized whale. In contrast to a network narrative, which establishes all the key players at the start and gives equal time to each, I would describe One Piece as a ripple narrative. You're drip-fed these small moments that don't feel too significant on their own, so there's no real struggle in understanding them. But as the Straw Hats journey onwards, their actions send ripples to where they're going and where they've been. For example, there's a bit where the Straw Hats do a really big thing, which causes their notoriety and bounties to increase. And you get an entire chapter dedicated to people they've previously met reacting to the news. Bits like this make their involvements in the events of the world feel that much grander and with greater implications. But what's equally as exciting as knowing the smaller moments will lead to bigger things is when you see something that you know will be significant, as each of the elements we get familiar with start to grow and reveal their layers of circles. At the start, you become familiar with one-off pirate groups looking for fame and fortune, and on the opposite end you have the world government, who want to control all aspects of One Piece's diverse and chaotic world. But then, after establishing those two, you learn of the Shichibukai, vastly powerful and infamous pirate captains who have formed an alliance with the world government, in exchange for complete control of their respective domains. And it's typically the Shichibukai that serve as antagonists, as the Straw Hats journey through their territories. And what makes them relevant is the fact that it is inevitable that Luffy and the Straw Hats will eventually come into conflict with them. As one gets defeated, the other members react and a new one takes their place. And from those reactions, you get glimpses into what kind of people the Straw Hats will have to inevitably face. And both the expected and unexpected merge together to create the absorbing world of One Piece, a world that balances out its complexity by simplifying everything else. Despite all the cogs turning and plates spinning, it never stops being the story of an absolute f**kwit on a boat and his adventure for treasure. And its capability to do that is, frankly, genius storytelling. So in spite of all that, there's one question left. Why do I not like it more than My Hero Academia? Well, I do still have some issues with its length, and I'm not referring to the length of the series as a whole, but the length of its arcs. They consist around each of the islands that the Straw Hats visit, and while the length is justified in establishing the setting and environment, there are times it feels like they go on for a while. For a quick reference, My Hero Academia's longest arc, that the anime has adapted, is the Shia Hisaikai arc, which is 40 chapters long and makes up the first half of season four. It has a great setup and some of the best moments of the series, but you can feel it drag in places, especially considering the arcs that preceded it never went above 25 chapters. One Piece's main arcs tend to go above and beyond 50 chapters. And again, great for setups and worlds, but there are times when the momentum starts to dip. For me, I found it was mainly towards the end of the arcs when all the fights were going down. There would typically be a big burst of emotion that gets you pumped, and then you get a number of back-to-back -back fights, or ones happening simultaneously but with different characters, both of which feel like they're riding the wave of emotion for a tad too long, this did lead to me occasionally skim reading even some of the series' best arcs. And if the wiki is to be believed, future arcs like Dress Rosa and Wano Country go on for over 100 chapters, which is a lot. 
And I say that knowing I have all of it. If I was reading One Piece week by week, that means I would be in one location for two years. And to me, it just feels odd that a series about adventuring and journeying the impossible journey would spend so long in one place. Again, it's not complicated, it's just long. Another issue is that there are times when not every member of the Straw Hats feels as significant as the others. This is usually either because they don't have much direct involvement with the current conflict, or because they haven't had much development recently. Each of them have enough backstory and personality to be really strong characters, but there are times when they can feel a bit one note, and more like tagalongs than participants in the plot. But I have seen times where less important characters ended up getting moments that really built them into key players, so I certainly have confidence that they will get that focus in the future. And I still haven't read Dressrosa or Wano Country, so for all I know, they're completely justified going over 100 chapters. I don't know, but I want to know, and that's the beautiful thing. I'm excited to find out. I want to keep going with it. For for all the shonens I've lost interest in, felt passive towards, or just straight up dropped, I want to stick with this one. Because when it gets good, it goes beyond good. And the mere fact it can still do that after 500 goddamn chapters is reason enough to stick with it. So I will continue on my adventure towards the horizon. Come hell or high water, I will make it to 1000 chapters. And when I finally get there, I'll probably make another video about it. Ya yeah, yo ya yeah, yo, dreaming. Don't give it up a loop ain't dreaming. Don't give it up a solo dreaming. Don't give it up a nah man dreaming. Don't give it, give it up, give it up, give it up, give it up, give it up. Oh, here's how the story goes. You find out about the treasure in the grand land, there's no doubt. The pirate whose eye is on it, he'll sing, I'll be king of the pirates, I'm gonna be king. Yayo, 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 ho, ho. <coughs>